Welcome to a short history of the Moodle tool guide. P.S. This will also work for other learning management systems. My name is Joyce Seitzinger. I work at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. I work there as a lecturer in blended learning in the Faculty of Health, um, but I have been working in e-learning since 1999, almost 14 years, um, and I've seen a lot of changes in that time. Um, and one of the best is uh, social media, and uh, so I'm an avid Twitterer, so um, you can find me at, at Cat's Pajamas NZ, and, uh, and I hope you do. Do say hi. Um, and if you do, you'll hear a lot of education technology tweets, but you will also get some ukulele ones. Sorry about that. So I'm currently in Melbourne. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be at Fusion this year. And this is Deakin University, where I work in Melbourne. And um, as you know, we are a desire to learn university. But before I moved to Australia, I was living in New Zealand, just off on the right there, to the right of Melbourne, uh, which I enjoyed very much. And in New Zealand, I was living in Napier, which you can see pinned right here. So I was working as an uh, e-learning advisor at a very small institution called the Eastern Institute of Technology, which had about um, 8,000 students, about 5,000 full-time equivalent that was. And we had about 350 staff, all that, that later expanded to about 550. And uh, I was the only e-learning advisor for about the first two to three years that I was there. Um, so it was quite rural, it was about four hours away from Wellington and about six hours away from Auckland, which would have been the main centers around there. So it was at EIT where uh, I really started to use Moodle for the very first time. Uh, before that I had used different learning management systems, Blackboard, WebCT, um, quite a few actually back in the Netherlands as well. Um, but uh, at EIT, because it was such a small institution, I ended up doing quite a few different things with it and, uh, and working with a large, large number of staff. Uh, I think by the end, uh, by the time that I left, I probably would have worked with everyone who was there. And, um, and so I ended up doing things like help desk type uh, tasks. I ended up doing uh, all the training with staff, um, uh, a lot of course development, um, but what I really enjoy doing, uh, a lot of learning design as well, where I would actually sit one-on-one -on -one or um, I was added to a group of lecturers in order to help do the learning design for many of our courses who were going either blended or online. And so in working with so many people, uh, I found this, that wiring a place for technology is easy, but wiring people for technology is hard. Uh, not many of us are uh, saw these systems as we went to school, high school. Um, maybe we saw them emerge, you know, during college or, or in, in, at university. And so we're not really used to them. And I think many of our institutions spend a lot of time putting all of the systems in place, but then actually don't give equal amounts of time and resourcing uh, to providing support and training for staff. And um, left to their own devices, uh, teaching staff who, uh, you know, ha as we all know, have a premium on their time, um, you know, are being left to actually teach themselves the learning management system. And what we then see, and this is a, 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 a progression that was uh, put forward by Martin Dugiamas, who was a founder of Moodle, uh, is that they actually go through several stages from, you know, just doing the very basics, putting up the handouts, to maybe going a little bit more advanced that we see there, you know, combining activities into sequences, and eventually going into using peer review models like the workshop, etc. But basically going from very simple to very complex, but sometimes that can take like up to three years for someone to actually go through that whole cycle. And so the question for me really became, you know, like how do I help staff to get the right mix inside their learning management uh, system inside their course sites when um, really we're flying blind and, and we don't really have a manual. I'm not saying that there are no manuals and no training books for Moodle or for other learning management system, but, uh, but I suppose, you know, when we don't have like an innate sense of how to use these things because we haven't been on the receiving end of it. 
Now there are some very helpful models um, like the uh, TPCK model or sometimes now also called the TPAC model which actually looks at the different domains of knowledge that a teacher needs and, and kind of aims to get people at kind of the center of that. So it looks at the three domains, content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, and also technological knowledge and how they intersect. But in fact, I often wonder whether we're not asking too much of our teachers. Maybe rather than asking them to, you know, contain all of those different domains of knowledge, maybe we should actually try to find a course team that can provide all those things. And so really it's the course that needs to cover all of those domains of knowledge. Now, while the TPAC model is certainly something to aspire to, um, I found that in the work that I did, just sitting next to lecturers, you know, for four, anywhere between four to 20 weeks uh, working um, side by side on their, on their course sites, I found that there were actually two main problems that came to the fore. And these were two traps that I constantly saw people fall into. It was either the content trap or they fell into the technology trap. And so I started to think that if we could at least avoid those two traps, then, um, you know, we could, there were a lot of gains to be had already. The content trap is the one that baffles me the most, I think, because uh, the content trap is, um, is where a teacher that you work with um, actually has an incredibly complex job. And it is such a complex, demanding job where, you know, a teacher has to do the content provision, lead and stimulate discussions, be a bit of an individual coach, provide motivation, assess learning, uh, be a little bit of a counselor as well. It's such a highly complex job. And yet, um, when it comes time to sit down and move that job or part of that job online, what they end up moving online is actually the content. And it's not just them. Quite often, this is actually what the institution um, demands, that at least at a minimum, all of the content is online, uh, when really content is everywhere. And it's much more important that you have designed a, uh, a journey of meaningful learning activities for the students to go through. The technology trap is the one that we see um, quite often after conference season, uh, perhaps after an all staff meeting, where someone has seen a colleague uh, make very successful use of a technology, and then they decide that they're going to start that as well. And I, that would mean that I would have discussions with people who said, I want to use a wiki. And I would say, well, what do you want to do? And they'd say, I want my students to have an in-depth discussion. Well, then the wiki is not really your answer. The um, discussion forum is going to be your answer, or possibly the chat room. And so this is really about um, being led by the technology and not being led by the learning activity. But having all these meetings with people and, and sitting side by side with them, it did end up making me feel a little bit like the mixer going around and around saying all the same things. And so I thought to myself, there must be a way that you can actually plot these activities, that you can actually plot what works well for what. And so that's what I did. I went and I plotted it, and uh, this is the result. It's called the Moodle Tool Guide for Teachers. And so across the top of the matrix, um, someone is asked, what is it that you want to achieve? What are you trying to build in your course side? Um, and so this is really around the pedagogical side of it. Um, do you want to do something around information transfer? Are you going to try to use this tool to disseminate information to your students? Is it around assessing learning? Will this tool allow you to assess your students' learning? Is it around communication and interaction? Uh, can this tool be used for communication and interaction among all of the participants, so you and your students? Or is it around co-creating content? Will it allow you and your students to actually collaborate and create content together? And then the last column was really uh, around Bloom's taxonomy and uh, giving an indication of whether a tool would allow you to work across all of the six levels or whether it might only touch one, two, or three. And then the very first column is actually more of a more of an indication. It's more about how easy that tool will actually be to set up because, of course, you always have to work with it in your own techn uh, technological limitations. 
Now, the other way to use the uh, matrix would actually to be to look at the boxes that are down the side. And this is if you do want to be led by the technology, maybe you choose a particular technology because it is easy to set up, then uh, you just look at what that technology will help you with and what it's good for. And uh, when I chose these, they, uh, they directly correlated to the options that were also available within the LMS. So what do you want to use? And then finally, it just worked with a very simple traffic light system. So green meant, yep, go ahead and use this tool. It'll absolutely do what you need to do. Orange meant, yeah, this could work, but you may have to do a little bit of learning design. You might want to go talk to someone with some learning design experience. And red meant, not stay away from this one. It's just not going to be the best tool for the job. So after I had created this matrix, um, three things really happened. So um, my colleagues around the institution at EIT uh, began to pin this to their boards. And what was really interesting about was that was that not only did it create a connection between me and them, so like I'd given them something and then I stayed in their mind because this thing was on their pin board. Uh, but the other thing that happened was that it created connections between them because they could see who was actively working you know, and, and doing extra training, etc., uh, in on their blended learning and on their online learning. Um, and so, you know, seeing this thing dotted around the institution and, in, in fact, seeing the number of instances increasing also made it clear that, you know, the institution was working towards a visible common goal. The second thing that happened was that I posted it to my blog, uh, which until then was having about one or two hits a day, and that was mainly from just spammers. Um, and so all of a sudden my blog was being read uh, by people other than my family. In fact, by quite a few more people than my family. So uh, within a few days, uh, it went from almost zero hits to 999 hits in one day. Um, and below there, you can see that a lot of what ended up uh, leading to that traffic, and this was just, you know, two days after I'd uploaded it, it had already been tweeted 531 times. And um, that's at the time of, uh, you know, that was back in 2010. So, you know, Twitter still wasn't as pervasive as it is now. So uh, as of today, the total number of down or views on on my blog of that uh, of that post is forty three thousand seven hundred eighty five. So that's about you know three years worth. And obviously the the peaks were very much at the beginning. Um, and the PDF has been downloaded a total of sixteen thousand seven hundred and sixty six times. Um, but remember that is just on my blog. Because the third thing that happened was that people began stealing it. Actually, no, it wasn't stealing. I released it under a Creative Commons license, um, and that meant that anybody was free to uh, reuse it as long as they uh, reshared it again as well, um, that they had to attribute it to me, and also that it was non-commercial, so uh, it, people weren't allowed to use it for commercial purposes. And although for years I've been telling people about the benefits of open educational resources, etc., this was really the first time that I got to experience what that's like in, uh, in real life. And what that license allowed it is, is that it allowed you know, users worldwide to actually make it suitable for their own context and their own community. So what we see here is a, is a French version, and, um, and it, it refers people to all of these French sites um, that have to do that are useful for uh, French Moodle users that I would never know about because I've only ever used Moodle in English. And so here you can see a German version. And here is a, f a version that I definitely could not have done. This is the Hebrew version, actually starting from the right side of the page. And so currently we've got 14 translations. And you'll note that there's actually quite a few um, uh, minority languages in there. So um, for minority language teaching, it's actually quite important that you are able to also use the program uh, and, and Moodle is available in all of those different languages, that you would then also have all of the support materials available in that same language. But of course, it didn't end there. Um, people also started to adapt it for other systems and mainly other learning management systems. So here we see the Blackboard 
tool guide. And then finally, the Cloud Deacon tool guide for teachers, which is based on Desire to Learn, and that was created by Colin and myself. So there you have it. It is really the Any LMS Tool Guide, and um, we strongly encourage anyone to go and download it and adapt it for their own context. So you can download it from tiny.cc slash d2l guide, or you can ask Colin. He's right there with you uh, for one. And don't forget that if you do create a new one, then uh, we do ask that you share it again and that you attribu attribute it to the original creator and that you re-release it under the Creative Commons. So thanks for listening to me. Um, if you have any questions, Colin is right there in the room with you. And in fact, he will tell you a little bit more about how we went about creating the uh, Deacon Tool Guide. And he will also help you setting up your own. Um, if you have any further questions, then these are the places where you can contact me. Uh, greetings from Melbourne.